So think about it. I'm sorry, I told you you'd have to wave. You waved earlier. Children, you can go to children's worship now. <laughs> See, when it's not usually my responsibility, I forget. So if kids, it's time to go to the children's worship now. Would you please like to yes. stand up and worship the Lord? Right now. Right this very second. I am sorry once again. So with all that being messed up and done, let me ask you, what is your favorite meal? I mean, if you had to have one thing and you said you could have one meal today, I mean, convicted criminals get one last meal, but what is your favorite meal? I don't think many of us would consider the Lord's Supper a meal. However, it has more value to us than anything else we could even ever eat and drink. The Lord's Supper has more value because it's about our eternal soul. It's about who we are. I mean, just think about the Lord's Supper right now and think about what it means to you. I mean, when you think about this time in the service when we take communion, what does it mean to you? What goes through your mind? What goes through your mind as you take the bread in the cup? Now, I'm not 100% convinced that we actually do it as it was instituted. However, I think the spiritual aspects of the Lord's Supper outweigh the mechanics of how we do it. So think about what that means to say it's my favorite meal. And remember a few things about this as we go through this lesson. And the first thing I want to remember is that the Lord's Supper was given by Jesus himself. I mean, Paul stated that he received the instruction from Jesus. We know that, that Paul didn't get any of his teaching from man. And he told the Galatians that. I did not get any of my teaching from man. It came from Jesus. And so Jesus established this, this celebration or this memorial, however you want to look at it, and we still do it today. I mean, this is something we do that Jesus himself instituted. That should bring us a connection to him. And this should help us to recall and focus on Jesus and what he was done for us. I mean, he said, take the bread. This is my body. Take the blood or the cup. This is my blood. And we think about what that means, what that means to, to eat the body, to drink the blood. And it sounds kind of vulgar and John Chapter 6 records how some of the disciples really had problems when Jesus was teaching this. And even people in history, they're saying cannibalism is happening in that Christian group because they would hear that, not understanding the spiritual aspects of it, not understanding what it was all about. Now, this particular celebration or memorial was established during... The Passover feast. He established it while they're preparing to have the Passover. I'm not really sure. If you go back and you look at the gospel, some say it's at the Passover, it's the night before they celebrated, but either way, it's during that time. It's during that particular time. The Passover feast was a celebration. It was a celebration about the release from bondage from Egypt. It was a feast of remembrance. It was a feast of thanksgiving. Remember, the last plague was the death of the firstborn. 
And God told his people that you put the blood on the doorpost and then your house will be passed over and you will not lose your firstborn. And so the, the, this is a celebration of that amazing time. And they are to remember that. But we know, as we say time and time again, the further we are removed from something, the less important it becomes to us. But this is something that God wanted his people to remember. Jesus wanted his people to remember. He established the Passover feast so that they would recall what God has done for them. And so Jesus establishes the Lord's Supper at this time in order for his followers, his disciples, to remember what he's doing for them. And it's virtually the same thing. Because when we wash ourselves in the blood, death passes over us. Not physically, but spiritually. We don't have to die like Jesus did. We don't have to be separated from God like Jesus was when he took the sins of the world upon his shoulders on the cross. We don't have to do that because Jesus done it for us. And again, back to our Scripture, back to our reading in Matthew 26, 26 through 28. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is the blood, my blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I want you to think about how the disciples must have felt. None of them realized as they're gathered in this upper room sharing this meal that this would be the last meal that they would have before they saw their leader, their teacher, and their friend hanging on a cross. They never dreamed that. And so as he's saying these things, even though he's been telling them, this is my mission on earth, it was probably going right over their head. What do you mean this is your body? What do you mean this is your blood? But friends, today we know exactly what he was talking about. We understand exactly what he was telling the disciples. So as we partake of the Lord's Supper, our minds need to be with Jesus. We need to be focused on him and what he's done. That is a, a time that is all about Jesus. See, because attitude is important. The way we take it, what's in our mind, Paul condemns a Corinthian church for their taking of the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 17, he says, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. And that's a slap in the face. When you come together as a church, you're doing more harm than you're doing good. I mean, can you imagine having that told to you? You know, we may feel that any time Christians gather, it's good. It's great. Paul says, not true. That's not true because when you come together for a purpose, you need to allow God's direction to guide you. You know, Paul speaks of the divisions in the church. And these divisions are more than what we might call cliques today. They were more quarrels and arguments and separations, ill feelings toward one another. And so it was creating really big issues within the church. In verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, in the first place, 
I hear that when you come together to the church, there is or there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Now, what we have to understand, there's always going to be divisions in the church. Keep that in mind. I mean, we're all washed in the blood. We're all saved by grace. But there's always going to be a certain amount of division because there are differences in our congregation. There's differences in who we are as people. Look at the next verse in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Now, when you read that on the surface, it probably doesn't mean a whole lot. But when you think about the differences in the church, there's always going to be differences in, in social standing, differences in wealth and not wealth, differences in our ethnic backgrounds, differences in the way we were raised. Differences in our attitude. There's always going to be a certain amount of differences. But what Paul is talking about here, when he says that there has to be differences to show which of you have God's approval, what he's speaking of here is the sad fact that there are many, or some, I should say, who wear the name Christian who are not committed to following God as they should or as he desires. The problem is that the attitude of the committed Christians or the approved, if you will, toward the unapproved Christians. First trip I made to Russia, we was having a group session. Well, matter of fact, it was a worship when this happened. And we were going to take communion. And we was getting ready to serve it. We had two men in this congregation who had really stepped up to take on the leadership and to be sure that the congregation was doing right. And they were doing a really good job. But here it came time to serve the communion. And there was a, a young couple that was in the congregation. They had a child together, but they weren't married and they were living together. And so when the communion tray come to them, one of these men got up and grabbed it from the guy and said, no, you can't take it. Of course, he didn't say it in English, but I found out later that's what he said. And it kind of caused a ruckus within the church. And that's kind of maybe what was going on at Corinth. And I had to explain to him later, I said, look, we don't practice a closed communion. Anybody that comes in to our assembly is welcome to partake. Because, friends, if you are lost and you partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, you're not going to get any more lost. You're still going to be in that bad state. It's just something else that you need to think about. But here, these approved Christians in Corinth were looking down their noses at those that they felt weren't as committed. You see, and of course, divisions also existed among the rich and the poor. You know, the Cor Corinthian church celebrated the Lord's Supper as part of the Agape Feast. And, and this is part of what I believe when I say I'm not sure we do it right. I think this is the way it was originally set up. It was part of a larger feast. It was a part of something bigger. You know, so the Corinthian church celebrated the Lord's Supper as part of the Agape Feast, which was very common in the first century church. It's what we might today call a potluck. The church would come together, they would all bring stuff, and they would put it out there, and it was everybody enjoy the meal. Everybody 
enjoy this time together. The problem was that there were those who had and those who had not. And those who had were not sharing with those who had not. You've probably seen it in a church potluck. Some of you women and maybe some of you men. You worked hard in the kitchen all day Saturday preparing two or three dishes because you know in your mind you want to make sure that there's enough for everybody. And you bring in your, your food and, and you place it there on the table and you see somebody come in and they'd open a can of corn, one can of corn, and set it on the table. So do we tell that person, sorry, you can't partake? You didn't bring enough. And that's kind of what was happening in, in Corinth. Those that, that had it, they, they were not sharing with those who couldn't afford to bring enough. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 21, it kind of explains to us that for as you eat and as you drink, I can't even see my PowerPoint. I don't know if you guys can or not. <laughs> so as far as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, and another gets drunk. And so you have those that aren't waiting on people. They're not sharing with others. They're eating what they brought, not allowing others to have enough to eat. And other people remain hungry. Other people are getting drunk. And so it's becoming just a big, big party and not so much a love feast I mean if you're not sharing with one another if you're not being sure that your brothers and sisters are taken care of where's the love where's the love in that and so Paul says you guys are doing this all wrong your attitude is completely wrong and again he takes the time to explain why he is so adamant about this instruction. Remember 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. He said, I'm adamant about this because this comes directly from Jesus. This isn't my rule. This isn't somebody else's rule. This came directly from Jesus. He's not teaching tradition. He's not teaching hearsay. He's teaching truth. And then he goes on in verse 26 and shows that this is to be perpetual. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when do we stop taking of the Lord's Supper? When Jesus returns. We proclaim his death. We memorialize it. We remember it until he comes back. Now, this verse also has created all kinds of other issues about the Lord's Supper, which we don't have time to get into today. But one of the issues is, well, can you take it just whenever you want? And that's one of the issues, because it says for whenever. I mean, we have particular verses that lead us to believe that we do it on the Lord's Day, on the first day of the week, every first day of the week. And we talked about that Wednesday night, so we won't get into it again here this morning. But we look, about, look at what the Lord's Supper is all about. You know, it's more about more than just about taking that little piece of bread and that little bit of juice and drinking it. It's about remembering. Remembering Jesus on the cross. Remembering that he died for us. And proclaiming, we believe he's coming back. He's coming back to take us with him. And we proclaim that until he returns. As we kind of alluded to earlier, self-examination. 
is necessary. And Paul expresses the importance of self-examination when taking the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 28, he says, A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Because this is a very solemn celebration. It's a solemn memorial. Because it's not just about doing what everybody else is doing. It's about doing it because of your heart. It's about doing it to remember and to know that you're right with God. You know, this is a time, if there is any time, to be sure your conscience is clear before God. And I know Christians who have refused to partake of the Lord's Supper because they'll say, I've got sin in my life. Friends, Christians, brothers and sisters, we can confess our sins before God before we receive the Supper. I mean, if we're sitting here and we know that there's something in our life, we can confess our sins. And even if we have something with another brother or sister, we can get up during that time and we can make it right. If it's bothering our conscience that bad. You know, Satan often tries to rob us of this great moment we have in our worship by telling us we're not worthy. By telling us, you can't do this. You're not perfect. But remember what John said in 1 John chapter 1, and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins. That's all he says. If we confess our sins. And we don't have to be in a certain place to do that. There's not a certain time. John doesn't say if, if you go to the preacher or one of the elders and confess your sin before service to start, you're fine. He says, if you confess your sins, God is going to be faithful and forgive you. He's going to purify. And so we need to remember that because we need to remember how important the Lord's Supper is and what it means to us as Christians. You know, so it's very important to recognize what the Lord's Supper is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 29, Paul goes on and says, For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Remember, we talked about how important attitude was. And Paul here saying, if you're just going through the motions, it's not a good thing. You need to be recognizing what it is. It is the body of Christ. It is the blood of Christ. There's a distinct purpose for the Lord's Supper in worship. It's not just something we do to tick a box. It has a distinct purpose, and it's important to us to help us recall that we are saved by the blood of Jesus. That he loved us so much that he gave himself. And those sins that we drag around, we can let them go because he took him with him to the cross. He took him away. We need to understand that this is a memorial and what it represents. And that like we said earlier, we're proclaiming that I believe with every fiber of my being, Jesus is coming back. And I'm going to do this to remind myself and to proclaim that until he does, or until he calls me home, whichever comes first. But if I go home before he comes back, those Christians to follow me continue to do this until he returns. Friends, we are responsible for doing it right. I mean, Paul goes on in this passage and he says that, that many of you are sick and weak and fallen asleep or died because of their failure 
to understand the Lord's Supper. I mean, have we ever thought about it being that serious? He said, many of you are struggling like that because you just your heart's in the wrong place. Your attitude isn't correct. And he says it's causing problems in your life. Do we think about the Lord's Supper being that important to every aspect of our life? See, as I said, it goes far beyond a meal that we eat, far beyond anything common. The Lord's Supper affects everything we do, every part of our life. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, in verse 31, he says, But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. That's a verse you don't always hear when people are talking about these. They they don't think about that. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. Because we know what's right. We know what's wrong. We know the attitude we should have. And Paul says if you examine yourselves, if you judge yourself, you'll understand, okay, this is the right attitude, this is the wrong attitude. This is the right understanding. This is the wrong understanding. And because God has given us wisdom, we'll understand what's right and what's wrong. And when we rightly judge ourselves, we're not going to come under the judgment of God. And isn't that a wonderful promise? To know that we can make the right decision based on the information God gives us. And from this lesson, I want you to understand just how important a part of the Lord's Supper is not only in our worship, but in your lives. How it affects every part of our lives. You know, as we come together, and we're together worshiping, and and praise be to God, we can be together. But it's a time we can personally commune with God and truly feel His presence in our lives. There's a lot of things, different things people do during communion. Many people will think of a song or even read a song out of the songbook. They'll pray. Or they'll just meditate on the cross, envision Jesus hanging there. Whatever it is that draws you closer to God at that point, I encourage you to do it. Because this is a very important part of your life. You know, it's a time to reflect. It's a time to give thanks. It's a time to judge ourselves and stand before God with no barriers. With nothing holding us back. And just allow the blood of Christ to flow over our hearts once again. And let us feel the cleansing from deep within. Let the Spirit work within us. Friends, it should be our favorite meal, as it does more for us than any other meal than we'll ever eat. So I want you to think about that. At this time, we're going to sing a song that's going to lead us into our communion service. But I do want to remind you as well, if you you need to respond to God's word today through baptism, need prayers of the church, or whatever, you still have that opportunity. We're not doing away with that today just because we're doing things in different order. But I want you to just think about this part of the service as we're going into the communion and what it means.